Hello everyone, my name is Caitlin Costello. Currently, this podcast is going through the audio run of The Frituals, the first book in my young adult fantasy series, The Fritual Saga. This week is a little different. You see, my newest novel, Until All the Stars Are Found, is currently available wherever you buy ebooks. This includes CaitlinCostello.com, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Kobo, Scribd, and many more. While audio and print copies will be available in a few months, I wanted to give you a little sneak preview here. Please enjoy chapter one of Until All the Stars Are Found. Chapter one. Running without gravity is really fucking weird. If I didn't have this harness on, who knows how far away from this wall I would be. It's one of several thoughts I have to push away along with what would happen if I hit the button for my grav boots. What time does Carrie think I can do? Do I love or hate gravity? I still don't fucking know. Running without gravity is, without a doubt, harder than running with a weighted backpack. Sure, running for 10 kilometers on the road is hard. Your body gets tired of the thud of the bag against your back, the repetitive impact of your feet striking the ground, over and over and over again. But without gravity? Your balance is shit. You constantly search for the ground. You don't have to worry about that with regular running. Let's go, Gomez! 400 more meters, then you're done for the day! My trainer yells from the floor below me. I glance down to the floor and see her standing in line with the other mentors. I don't have long to look at her face before I zip past her with the rest of the pack. But I can't tell if she's pleased or not. I look down at the track lanes. The LED lights that illuminate my feet are a bright lime green, letting me know I'm on track for whatever pace Carrie wants me to run. The neighbor to my left has a track that turns a bright yellow, letting him know he isn't running on par. Come on, Gomez! 400 meters, then I can take this goddamn harness off. I don't know when it happened, but my shirt has slid up over the harness again leaving the coarse nylon to rub the same spot it had two days ago. The raw skin burns with the friction and the sweat dripping into it. Someone hits a button and a glowing ring three meters in diameter slides out of the floor off the edge of the track. The pack surges forward the last hundred meters, our uneven breathing and my heartbeat pounding in my ears before we go airborne. I hit the button on my side and the harness releases its hold on the track and soar through the air, pinwheeling in a mass of arms and legs with my peers before I hit the mat wall with a thud. I brace for the impact and grab the handholds, scurrying as fast as I can, my legs floating off the wall as I pull myself down. With a grunt, I pull my legs down against the lack of gravity and hit the grav lock button, slamming my feet to the ground. I move away from the other recruits, and I put my hands on my knees, trying to catch my breath. Nope. Up. Walking. Let's go, Carrie says, walking past me. I stand and move to the line where the others who already finished wait. We watch, back stiff and at attention, while the others finish, their tracks in a myriad of red, yellow, and green. I peer up at the screen above our heads, where the scoreboard will update in a few moments. This scoreboard is how the galactic garrison tracks people's progress through ranks. When the last person hits the wall, all the mentors tap their tablets, and the numbers change. I watch as my name turns green and shifts slightly up the chart. Ada Gomez, plus two. Someone taps out a command, and gravity returns. My thick ponytail falls to my back, the black hair sticking to the sweat across my shoulders. At ease, soldiers. Good work today. We will be back here tomorrow at 0500. There is a mixture of sighs of relief that we are done for the day, and groans of disgust at how early we'll have to be out of bed to make it here in the morning. Fuck me, I breathe, trying to contain my hair. On the final twist, the hairband breaks, snapping across the back of my hand, leaving a nice red welt. I sigh and reach into my pocket, pulling another hair tie out as Carrie walks over to me. That wasn't bad. How did your ankle feel? Carrie asks, scrolling through the stats on the tablet. 
She puts her hand out, and I hand her the data chip that syncs her tablet to my harness. While the harness I wear keeps me from flying away, it also scans my heart rate, pace, cadence, and a slew of other data I don't understand. Fine, I guess. I don't think it was my best go, but it wasn't my worst, I say, unbuckling the harness and hanging it up on the wall. Carrie smirks and looks back down at the tablet. Okay. I pause. Carrie usually has more to say than that. Okay. Okay. She turns and walks toward her office. My brain spins. Just okay? I call after her. Is she pissed off at me? But she smiled. Did I fuck up? Carrie? Go shower, then meet me in my office, she says, heading out of the training block. Fuck. I mutter to the empty air. My brain spirals through all the potential outcomes. I met Carrie three years ago. They sent me to her not long after my parents died. I was acting out in school, and the school didn't know what to do. They didn't have the capacity to deal with someone who lost both parents at once and was in the foster system and not doing okay. So, like most of the adults in my life, they passed me off to someone else. Someone handed me a pamphlet and suggested I check out the garrison as a way to deal with all the feelings. It was a youth system that was meant to help us become vibrant young leaders in our community. I thought at first it was stupid. That was when Carrie came into my life. Sergeant Carrie Lima is my mentor. She listened, helped me figure out a plan, and what I wanted for me. She helped me out of a dark time and set me back on track. With her help, I graduated their program and diverted my training from on-world service to off-world. I followed the other femmes to the locker room and stripped down, throw the borrowed fatigues in a laundry bin, grab a towel, and head to the showers. I scrub down quickly. The scalding water wicks away the sweat, but burns where the harness rubbed against my side. I get out of the shower, towel off, and pull on my civilian clothes. A pair of ripped black jeans and a thin blue t-shirt. My sneakers have a few holes that are only apparent when you step in a puddle. And the rubber bottoms have almost no treads left. I wring as much of the water out of my hair and search in vain in my bag for another hair tie to make a neater bun. But this is my last one. Maybe I can find one at home tonight after Jackson goes to sleep. The other girls pull on their civilian clothes. The holes in their jeans are fashionable and on purpose. Mine are holy because I've worn the same pair of jeans for three years now. I sling my small backpack over my shoulder and head out of the lockers into the hallway. The third door on the right, I pause. Sergeant Lima, may I enter? I step back and look down the hall. Normally, by this time on a Friday afternoon, the training center's halls are empty and the lights are turned down. Today, however, the space is still brightly lit with LEDs, and a man waits down the hall. From this distance, I can't make out the rank patch on his sleeve, but his tight stance clues me in that he must be some sort of officer. He looks up from the tablet he has been reading at me and nods. I nod back and turn to the door. Carrie opens the door and beckons me inside. In contrast to the bright hallway, the office is dim, and the sole light in the room comes from Carrie's tablet and the projector shining on the wall. Carrie sits back down behind her desk and pulls up a graph on her tablet and sends the data to the projector. I stand tall, hands behind my back, waiting for Carrie to ask me to sit. Retired or not, Carrie has specific standards she wants me to meet. So, Carrie says, turning back to me, sit on down, Ada. How are classes going? I want to roll my eyes, but don't. If Carrie is asking something, there's a purpose. My classes are going well. May I be candid, I ask. Yes, Ada, you may always be candid with me, she says. I don't see the point in them anymore. I know, I know, I put my hands up. I know I need them to qualify. I'm doing my best with them. I passed that mech test last week with a B plus, but the summer classes at the college so far are nothing. I'm the only one doing anything. And then going to the training base six days a week? I just feel run down. Carrie nods. That makes sense. She taps something on the tablet, sets it down, and looks up at me. She steeples her hand and doesn't speak for a moment. Just watches me. I do my best not to squirm. Do you realize what today is? Carrie asks. I try not to grin. 
as long as all my paperwork went through on time, this weekend should be my rank approval. Carrie nods. Today was also the last day to qualify for the next shift to go off-world. Carrie says, pulling up a chart with the requirements. These are all stats I've seen and memorized over the last year. One mile run. Earth. Seven minute cutoff. One mile run. Zero G. Nine minute cutoff. Sixty sit-ups. Two minutes. Sixty push-ups. Two minutes. Most of these are things that I've already passed, and if I haven't yet, I'm within one or two points of each. Carrie grins. Over the last few days, the other mentors and I have incorporated the parts of their specialized training requirements into the group settings. Oh, how different are those requirements? I ask, trying not to sound too eager. Two more taps and the comparisons are up on the screen. The most significant difference is the mile times. The Earth mile is still seven minutes, but the gravity-free mile is a whole minute faster. Damn. I sit back in my chair. So, what do I need to change to make the next cutoff? I try to think of where I could scrounge up some extra time to have additional training sessions with Carrie. Nothing. With one more tap, my stats are up on screen. My eyes fall to the gravity run, and my mouth drops open. The needed time was eight minutes. I made it with ten seconds to spare. That can't be right, I say. There's no f- There's no way. How? I catch myself mid-swear and run over the rest of the sentence, hoping she won't notice. She shoots me a look that says she did notice, but doesn't admonish me. The harness doesn't lie. I've read countless news articles about people that have tried to claim that they had done better than the harness said, but the harness was always the one the officials looked to. The belt has a 98.8% accuracy. So, what do I do now? Carrie taps the intercom button and says, We are ready for you, Staff Sergeant. A moment later, the man that I saw in the hallway enters the room. I jump to my feet and give a salute. He nods and settles into the chair next to me. At ease, Private Gomez. I am Staff Sergeant O'Malley. I work for the Galactic Garrison and assist in the recruitment of the Specialized Operations Division. Sergeant Lima here tells me you have some interest in joining our division. I nod. Yes, sir. I've looked at what it offers, and I would like to study in either the jumper or fighter lines and medic practice. I know for sure I want to go as a medic. He looks me over. You're small, but that can be good in a fighter, and we are always looking for medics. Too many teams don't take care of their medics. He looked up at my stats. Sergeant Lima sent me your paperwork before today's deadline. After reviewing them, I think you'd be a great fit for the special ops division. I'm sure Sergeant Lima told you that today was the last day to qualify for the next draft. Did she explain anything else? Carrie shook her head. No, sir. I figured it would be better for you to explain the next steps. O'Malley nodded. Right. Well, you may or may not know that we recently moved our special operations base on World to Houston. My mouth goes dry. Houston? It's not right outside New Seattle anymore? No, we found too many from New Seattle ended up not passing the second round of testing, so administration demoted the location to a basic infantry station. That change occurred in the past few weeks. It may not be public knowledge yet. Oh, okay, that makes sense. I say, thinking of Sarkis. If I have to leave for Houston, who will be there for him? I wonder. Is that an issue? The sergeant asks. Oh, no, no. Just surprising, but it's fine. Carrie, knowing that I'm thinking of my brother, gives me a sad smile. All right, O'Malley continues. You'll be tested once you arrive at Houston to see if you are ready to go off-world. If you pass those tests, you'll move on to the space station. Should you fail, we'll send you to do more infantry work on-world. You can try for the Spec Ops twice in your career. I nod as he speaks. Most of the information are things I already know. Thank you for explaining all of that. My main question is, when would I have to report for transport? If you are ready to move on, report to the base in New Seattle by 1300 to catch the eco train to Houston. Before your departure, there will be a short test to determine if you really deserve to go to Houston. 
At 1300? I glance up at the clock on the wall. It gives me less than 24 hours to get everything together and to get out the door. Okay. What sort of paperwork would I need to finish? You need your identification cards and a signature of clearance from your parent or guardian. I try to keep my face clear, but I share a glance with Carrie. She is just as surprised as me. The thin lines around her mouth and a small frown. Even if she's over 18? Yes, this is required. Will this be an issue? O'Malley asks, interlacing his fingers. I hate the way he asks that. Will it be an issue? Each time he does, it feels like a challenge. One I'm not meant to meet. It makes my skin crawl every time. Carrie gives me a nod, encouraging me to say my piece. I clear my throat. Honestly, sir, it may be. I've recently grown out of the foster system. I don't have the best relationship with my foster parent. I don't know if I will get him to sign off. If he's home during the next few days, he most likely will be blackout drunk. I glance at my hands uncomfortably, considering my options, and look up. I have a meeting after this with my social worker. Could she sign off? She has been helping me get ready for the transition out of his home. I think that should work. Let me make a quick call to verify. He pulls out his phone and steps outside. I spin around to face her as soon as he steps out of the room. Carrie, is this really going to happen? Yes, Ada. You will go off-world. You didn't want to know how you've been doing compared to the mark, but you've ranked past it for weeks now. She laughs. I told you. You train with me, and you would make it. I didn't go through all that training for nothing, she says, spinning and pointing to her medals on the wall. I know, I know, but I still didn't believe that I could do it. There's just been so much happening. A soft knock at the door puts a pause in our celebration as O'Malley re-enters the room. He glances between Carrie and I, his brow furrowed for a moment in disapproval of our antics. They said that you could get your main signature from your social worker. They'd also like you to attempt to get a signature from your foster father, just in case. I sigh. Okay, I'll try. I turn to Carrie. Could you forward the forms to me? She nods. Of course. Thank you for stopping by, Sergeant O'Malley. I will make sure Ada is all set and on her way to you soon. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you on our base in a few days. I stand and shake his hand. You as well, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. I follow him to the door and slowly close it. Craning my neck, I watch him go down the hall until I know he's far enough away and he won't hear me. Great expanse, Carrie! I'm going off-world! She squeals and jumps up, rushing around the desk and hugging me. I'm so proud of you, Ada. She taps down the screen and the projector goes black. Okay, now we need to talk about what you're going to need to do over the next few days. The sobering reality of the ticking clock on the wall floods back. Right. Less than 24 hours before I have to go. Exactly. First, they're saying you need to be there at 1300, but that is wrong. You need to be there closer to 1100. The train will leave at 1300. If you get there that late, you'll miss the train and be screwed, especially if they're adding a little test, she says, adding air quotes. How are you going to get to the bus station? I can walk. It isn't too far. I just need to make sure I get up with enough time. Jackson won't care when I leave. I go scrapping at weird hours all the time. I look at the tiny screen of my watch, and I pull up my bank account and check out my credits. Do you know where I can get a cheap tablet? Maybe. Why? Carrie asks. I have a hundred credits. I told Sarkis I would get him one for his birthday or before I go, whichever came first. So he can still talk to me sometimes. Carrie opens her mouth to say something, but I cut her off. I already told him it would likely only be once a week, if that. It's mainly for messenger, and only when I am off duty. Okay, hit up this guy. He should be able to give you a decent enough tablet. Do you have a large backpack you can put your stuff in? She shoots a contact to my inbox. I think for a second, but shake my head. No, Jackson got rid of the duffel bag I moved in with. Carrie sighs. Of course he did because why would the man want to keep a decent piece of equipment? 
she grumbles, going into her closet and pulling out a medium-sized duffel bag. You don't need to pack much. Basic toiletries, a few outfits for when you are off duty. They will give you anything else you need. You'll also need your identification cards. Thank you, I say, pulling up the list on my watch screen and rotating the dial to scroll through the contents. You don't know how much all of this means to me. You're helping me so much. She shrugs. Don't get sappy on me now, Gomez. You still have got a ton of work to do. She glances at the clock. Go. You don't want to be late again. I follow her gaze. Shit. I jump from my chair. Thanks, Carrie. Seriously. Then, scooping up the bag, run for the door. I glance over my shoulder as the door closes and see Carrie smile and shake her head.